<clears throat> okay, so uh, today we'll talk about three architects. Well, the first one was an engineer, but uh, quite quite a remarkable engineer, uh, architecturally speaking. Pierre Luigi Nervi. All three architects were born on the same day, but in different uh, in different years. So let's begin with um, uh, Pierre Luigi Nervi, uh, born in 1891 uh, on. 21st on the 21st of June, and today is the 21st of June, but 2022. He died in 1979, was an Italian engineer and architect. He studied at the University of Bologna, graduating in 1913. Nervi taught as a professor of engineering at Rome University from 1946 to 1961 and is known worldwide as a structural engineer and architect. And for his innovative use of reinforced concrete, especially with numerous notable thin shell structures worldwide. I would add to this that he is also the, he was the, I don't know, the initiator, uh, maybe he paid for it. Uh, anyway, he is behind the most comprehensive and the most beautiful uh, history of world architecture, uh, which you can find uh, in 18 volumes. Again, not an architect was behind it, but an engineer. That is Pierre Luigi Nervi. Um, so, the art of the structure. What about that? What about that? In there are so many schools of architecture in the world who think which thing that structure has nothing to do with art. Well, in this case. And these are not my words. I took them from, from the web, by the way, of the works of um, Pierre Luigi Nervi, the art of the structure. The, art, the structure became art, and, uh, or became architecture, and thus art. The master of parametric design before parametry. So he, he worked in. Uh, in ways which uh, today are possible because of uh, the uh, parametric design, but at, at the time when he did those things, there was no, uh, you know, explicit uh, digital technology refer relating to what we call parametric design. This was the man, an intense man, uh, an intellectual, a man of culture, a man who loved beauty, a man who loved architecture. And he was also an architect, although he was trained as an engineer. Bravo to him, Pierre Luigi Nervi. We need examples like him. We need heroes. And you know, these heroes in architecture uh, have something in common. They all search for beauty in whatever way. Uh, today, we'll talk about him. We'll talk about Smiljan Radic, an architect who also searched in his own way for what we call beauty, and then Paolo Soleri, the remarkable Italian, another Italian today, born on the 21st of June, who um, was a visionary and uh, started to build a city, a city, nothing else, with volunteers from all over the world, a dreamer. In a way, all three are and were dreamers, and you cannot be a good architect if you are not also a dreamer. It's impossible. Because you you are supposed to implement dreams to uh, to you know to to realize them to bring them to life, and that's what architects uh, do uh, in their field. In other fields, of course, uh, other people use different uh, ways of externalizing their creative demons, so to speak. Torino, Esposizione, uh, Esposizione, 1949. I mean, look at this structure. You know, it's. Uh, uh, it's structure, but it's also beautiful, and uh, it functions. It's it's um, you know so-called clean. It is uh, it is. Uh, uh, it, it, I could almost say it is flying, you know. And this has to do not just with calculation, but also with the ineffable uh, uh, character of what we call beauty. This is an earlier work, 1949, immediately, immediately after the war uh, in Torino. I mean, uh, look, at, look, look at this, it is logical, but it's not just logical, you know, it's, it has grace. 
That's what it is. It has grace. It's not just willed, but it's also graceful. And to make a structure graceful, for this, you need a certain sensibility. I mean, look at this, you know, all the uh, dynamic forces that make a structure work are here expressed in, a, in an aesthetically convincing way. Pierre Luigi Nervi. The art of the structure, indeed. Now, the UNESCO headquarters in Paris from 1951, one year later, he collaborated with Marcel Breuer and Bernard Zerfus. Uh, I don't know exactly which part of the building he worked on. You know, I guess the structure in general of the UNESCO building, uh, maybe, you know, this supports, uh, the structural supports uh, were, you know, uh, done by him, uh, maybe aesthetically to an extent at least too, but he worked with two architects. Uh, I love this, this um, you know, canopy, which is probably his work. And again, we see the poet a form, we see the artist, as an engineer or the engineer as an artist, the structural engineer as an artist. And about this, our friend Bruce Danzinger and structural engineer from Los Angeles told us uh, even the last time he entered here on the Zoom platform, he said that he is um, you know, very concerned and very interested in uh, imagination, in imagination, yes. And uh, you know, from between imagination and, uh, and art is a, is a short distance and between imagination and uh, dream and art is also a short uh, distance. We need, we need imaginative people. He could have done this in a very, you know, in a much more banal way. Why did he complicate himself? Well, he complicated himself because he wanted to do, create something. That's why, you know, and he did create something. And I think it's uh, as, uh, as uh, uplifting as this uh, sculpture mobile by uh, Alexander Calder, the uh, North American uh, sculptor who was also an engineer. Bravo to both Calder and Pierre Luigi Nervi. This is what you know artists and great artists uh, artists do, and I include here also writers, composers, and so on. They uplift you through the adventurous quest for beauty, for, uh, for something that transcends the prose of everyday life through being different, through, be, from being, uh, through being ex exceptional. I mean, you see here, you know, it's, it's structure, but it's more than structure. It's, uh, uh, you know, there are things that touch your heart, as Le Corbusier would say, and Frank Lloyd Wright as well. Uh, they didn't uh, agree on too many things, but on this they both agreed. Frank Lloyd Wright and, and Le Corbusier agreed that first should come the heart, not the brain, the heart. And I would agree with them. And we should remember this. It's not the brain first. It's the heart. And strangely, even uh, Albert Einstein uh, thought the same way, a scientist. We should listen to these people because they knew what they were talking about. The heart should come first. Frank Lloyd Rice uh, talked about an educated heart. And that's what I'm trying to do here, to educate my own heart and other people's hearts through the works of important uh, creators in the field of architecture. The Pirelli Tower, a very remarkable work in Milan, not too far away from the train station, um, collaborated, uh, he collaborated with Gio Ponti, himself a celebrated uh, architect, and I talk about him too on his day of birth and the day he died, 1950, so 70, 72 years ago. Look at, the, look at this structure, you know, it's uh, rational, but it's also elegant, you know, and uh, it's a cross section through the building, 
and the building does have a, a, a remarkable uh, uh, elegance, not just in plan, but also in section. Again and again, for something like this, we need the architect and the engineer as artists, as sensible, sensitive people. I, otherwise, they would not have done it so gracefully. The, the Pirelli Tower uh, near the train station in Milan, uh, the building stands and is uh, still uh, noticeable uh, from, uh, from a distance. Uh, here it is during the construction, uh, the Pirelli Tower and, uh, you know, getting uh, closer to, to being finalized the work. Uh, and here it is. It is very elegant, isn't it? And this year, there is the uh, Chicago Tribune Tower uh, competition centennial, 100 years since um, that tower, uh, that famous competition took place in Chicago. And I want to launch several competitions about, but the problem is I don't think our age needs more uh, encouragements about, uh, you know, building taller and taller and taller and taller because we are confronted, as you know, with various crises. But still, if we are to talk about a tall building which is graceful, like this one, why not? And this is very, very graceful indeed. I mean, look, look, look at this, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, gradually becoming thinner and thinner towards the top. And it is shown this in the elevation of the building. We saw the cross section, but it's a very, very elegant uh, uh, tower that Gio Ponti and uh, uh, Luigi and, uh, and uh, Nervi uh, built. I like it very much. It's not banal, and it's not banal exactly because uh, it's uh, it's um, it, it's an artwork uh, out of engineering and uh, functional uh, concerns and so on. They created a, a piece, an architectural piece, which uh, can be, I think, uh, called uh, can be called art. Uh, Pierre Luigi Nervi again. He was the, uh, I think, the initiator, the patron, or whatever it was, of that formidable history of world architecture in 18 volumes, published by Electa and then in the United States by Abrams. is a beautiful. If you, you can, you can find the the, the volumes of this remarkable uh, publication, uh, uh, the history of world architecture in 18 volumes. And again, Pierre Luigi Nervi is was the, I don't know exactly what he was the you know, the promoter, the patron, the editor, he was the major force there. Uh, and uh, there were very important scholars who contributed like um, Manfredo Tafuri or Christian Norbert Schulz. Uh, anyway. Palazzetto dello Sport, Rome, 1958. Um, here it is, and uh, there is a model of it uh, in, the, in the hallways of the, the University of Architecture in Bucharest. Uh, unfortunately, I think this one, uh, uh, I think is this one because he built two, uh, if I remember well, uh, was affected by some interventions. But look at these columns, you know, they are, almost expressionistic, you know, they are expressing the, you know, the, the fluidity of the uh, forces that uh, uh, activate uh, and support the building in uh, sculptural ways, but also in logical, in rational ways. The plan is uh, Apollonian, it's, it's, it's circular, it's a circle, but look at the columns, you know, uh, this is art, it is art. It's not just calculation, it transcends calculation. Um, acknowledging what Louis Kahn said, a great building begins with the immeasurable, and then it goes through the measurable, and then in the end, it comes back into the immeasurable. Unfortunately, uh, you can see here already, it was uh, 
you know, left kind of an, uh, you know, neglected, uh, abandoned the building, but it was not destroyed. Look at the look at the ceiling, at the roofing. You know, it's uh, it's it's an engineering uh, engineering uh, masterpiece, and so are these columns, which move me with, uh, you know, the elegance, uh, the gentle, uh, graceful uh, logic. It's both uh, Gothic and uh, modern and classical. It transcends actually, you know, a specific style. An adventure again, building a good building is and should be an adventure. Otherwise it's just a routine and you'll never get a good building because of a routine. It has to be, it has to be an adventure. It has beauty, doesn't matter how you look at it, in diagrams, in plans, in sections, in details. Now, the study of Flaminio in Rome, 1957. These are not, uh, you know, per se poetical programs, now a stadium, but in the, in the hands of the right engineer and the right architect, uh, even a prosaic function could generate poetical structures or poetical buildings. Palazzo del Lavoro, Turin, 1961. Look at these columns again and the, uh, you know, the uh, structural uh, part of the, of, the, of the slab above them. I think it's it's uh, uplifting, no? Because again, it's about beauty. And it could have done very easy. It could have been done very easily without pro aesthetical preoccupations. But this is not what a sensitive person would accept. You know, it, it simply wouldn't. So what gives nobility to the human work? Exactly transcending the limits of prose. I am talking about, uh, you know, what refers to prosaic as opposed to poetic. Even during the construction, the structure is, uh, you know, imposing and uh, inspiring. So again, this is not just the result of calculation. Of course, there is calculation. He was a structural engineer, but he was a structural engineer who aspired towards the art of the structure, not just structure, the art of the structure, like we, we can see clearly here. Thus, he does deserve also the title of an architect. He was an architect as well. Uh, from Walter Grop, you said that architecture begins where engineering ends. It's not quite like this. I mean, it is in a way, but uh, through the, uh, the example of Pierluigi Nervi, it is shown clearly that also an engineer could transform engineering into, into, into uh, art or architecture. Because look, it's about beauty. And when we listen to Bruce Denziger, the remarkable engineer from Los Angeles, who is our friend here, talk about beauty and imagination, I truly feel inspired, you know? I mean, he talks about things that the architects don't talk about very often. Isn't it remarkable? Look here, the structure, you know, in plan, because you see it, you know? Uh, who would say that this is not uh, a concern with beauty? It is. Look at the drawings, you know, again, it's beauty, but it's also structure. It's also calculation. It's both. Pierluigi Nervi. Fire consumes Pierluigi Nervi's Palazzo del Lavoro. Um, yes, this happens, you know, there are accidents, but uh, what can we do? Sacro Cuore. Bell Tower in Firenze, 1962. Look at this. 
Is this architecture? Of course it is. Yes, Firenze, the Florence, the city where you would say nothing else can be invented because the Renaissance already did it all. It's not so. They do have examples of, uh, you know, not very, you know, not very uh, frequent, but there are examples of modernity like here. This, uh, this tower built by Pierluigi Nervi is definitely modern, isn't it? Paper mill, Mantua, Italy, uh, with a remarkable structure, 1962. Now look at this, you know, it's, it's uh, audacious, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, vigorous, it's elegant, it's uh, dramatic, even it's cultural, it's, uh, it's, it's functioning very well as structure, but it's also uh, bringing emotions. And uh, what else can we say? You know, engineering at its best becomes art, becomes architecture. And architecture to, be, to deserve its name should aspire towards being art as well. Otherwise, it's, it remains just building. That's not enough to be called architecture. Here they are, uh, you know, all the members of the group that build this. Where is he? Is he somewhere here? Anyway, he must be somewhere here. Anyway. Architecture is a challenge, industry and the suspended factory. You know, these words I love, architecture as a challenge. Architecture as a challenge, when it is not a challenge, it's not architecture. This we must know. Look at this, you know, it, 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 it is, uh, you know, almost, uh, almost, uh, I mean, no, it's not arrogant towards uh, gravita the gravitational force, it's not, but it asserts its freedom uh, and is uh, suspended beautifully just to places this uh, immense, immense building, which is actually a bridge, kind of a bridge. The, the building is suspended from the bridge. Pierluigi Nervi, architecture is a challenge. Again and again, architecture is a challenge. We should repeat this over and over again. What does that mean, architecture is a challenge? Well, as the um, uh, you know, the logo of SciArc uh, says, to hell with the regulations, we are going for the unknown. Well, architecture is a challenge means exactly this, going for the unknown, not for the known, because if it is the known, it's not a challenge. To be a challenge, you have to explore the unknown, the unexplored. George Washington Bridge Bus Station in New York City, 1963. This I saw without knowing that this was by Pierluigi Nervi. I was myself in a bus, I passed by it. And without knowing that there was, you know, a great engineer, Pierluigi Nervi here, I felt the power of architecture. I said to myself, looking through the window, wow, this is a very interesting architecture. Who did this? Yes, it's regular, yes, but it's not just regular, you know, it has uh, sculptural drama. Uh, and uh, it stands out, it stands out because of the force and integrity of the structure. I wasn't inside here. I, I was I was seeing it, uh, you know, from a bus outside the, the building. But uh, look, it's here. Yeah, a little marble, not so little actually. 1962. Now. Um, As, as Le Corbusier said, architecture touches your heart. That's what I felt then. It touched, it, it, it touched my heart. It, I, 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 without knowing who did it, I just, I mean, look at this column here. It's, uh, I, I don't even know very well what's going on here. It, it's almost, uh, you know, unstable. You look here at the bottom, what is going on, you know? 
such a massive column, but also um, uh, twisted, uh, you know, sitting uh, on the floor on the uh, yeah with the, you know on a, in a narrow base. An exploration in instability brings in dynamic qualities to architecture. That's why instability is very, very important to explore in architecture, architecture and instability. Excessive stability, uh, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, uh, like saying no to the dynamic qualities of life and even needs, not just qualities, then the, the need for movement, even for instability. If you can bring instability with instabi instability, I think uh, you achieve great things. Look at it. You know, this was done by an engineer, but this is art. It's almost a dangerous art. I think it's remarkable what he did here. Absolutely remarkable. Did he work harder for this? Of course he did. You know, this kind of work doesn't, uh, you know, just come uh, into being uh, without uh, some efforts. But why did he make these efforts? Because he wanted to be a poet. And he did become a poet. And look at this color, you know. It's really amazing, you know, how massive it is and considering what it supports and how it so-called sits or touches the ground or the ground floor is, uh, or the slab is, um, again, you know, a common engineer would never do something like this, but he was not a common engineer. That's it. Now the Cathedral of St. Mary of the Assumption in San Francisco, he worked with Pietro Belluschi, an important Italian architect. And here you will see also again, remarkable things. In California, 1967, so 33 plus 22, 55 years ago, they built this cathedral in San Francisco, Pietro Belluschi and uh, Pierluigi Nervi. Uh, yeah, that's what you get, you know, when you have uh, uh, people who love what they do and they love architecture as a challenge and you see the interior is, it's almost sublime, you know, this, uh, it's majestic. It's um, modern, it's Gothic, it's uh, ornamental, it's structural, it's massive, it's, um, uh, you know, uplifting, it's, uh, it's monumental, it's inspiring, it's, it's a cathedral. Look at the ceiling and the roofing. Well, it puts to shame the builders of so many churches and cathedrals who have nothing, which have nothing to say, which we don't even use the services of architects. Uh, look at this. Is it ornamental? Of course it is. Is it structural? Of course it is. Are the structure and the ornament united? Of course they are, as they should be. And, uh, you know. It has certain things towards the outside that remind one of the cathedral, also for St. Mary uh, that uh, Kenzo Tange built uh, in Japan. Uh, maybe towards the outside is a little bit more static, but the interior has, uh, because of this, uh, I call it the ornamental structuralism of, of what they did here is uh, somehow richer and uh, a little bit uh, more uh, a gentle, although the monumentality is for all to see. Very nice work. Bravo to Pietro Belluschi and uh, Pierluigi Nervi, two Italians. And again, the master of, uh, you know, bringing all those forces that have to go to the ground through, uh, you know, slightly tormented or maybe not slightly tormented uh, you know, massive columns which are inspiring through the sculpturalness, uh, he did it again. Pierluigi Nervi, the lover of architecture, because only a lover of architecture could, uh, uh, you know, uh, support and generate and edit, or I don't know exactly what he did, but he's the, the you know, the, the main force behind that formidable history of world architecture in 18 volumes, an engineer. 
But what an engineer. Pierre Luigi Nervi. A look at the plan. An adventure, a challenge. Yes, it's a square, you know, approximately it's, but then you have the octagon, uh, you know, inside. So there are rotations there and it's dynamic. That's what I said. It's static and unstable or dynamic at the same time. Because it is for the glory of God. That's what it is. No, it's a cathedral. It's supposed to be. Look at this. It touches, you know, I mean, this is massive. But it touches, you know, uh, elementally, to use the word that uh, Ravenna would use, just, uh, you know, no more, no less. Just in one point, I mean, four points probably. And here again, it's, it's, it's drama, it's calculated drama, it's, uh, it's art, yes, it's art. Now, Paul VI audience hall at, at the Vatican City in 1971. Um, this one, yeah, he worked on the structure. I don't know who was the, 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 the architect, but here there are some strange things. So let me see if I remember. It's not a, an accident that you see this head of a reptile here um, because, um, let's see. Vatican occulta symbols. There are some occult uh, uh, symbols here. You know, you see the, I, I, I don't know enough about it. I should have read more. But if you look at the, the image of the big space here, somehow, you know, someone thought that it could resemble the head of this reptile with the eyes. And uh, I, I, I don't know what the occult symbol is, but, um, it, it might be, I don't know, because when you, when you transgress the frontiers between art and nature, certain similarities uh, or similitudes could show up. And uh, there might be some uh, hidden meaning behind this. I don't know. But again, we are dealing here with something that transcends mere calculation. It's, it's, uh, it's art. That's what it is. And in the background of the Pope, also we see art, an art of our time, not other times. Vaticano, culta symbols, symbols, uh, symbolos. Um, and look at the structure. In the making. Yeah, here it is, uh, but uh, I don't know. But you can you can search on the web if you are curious. Maybe you can. I'm sure you can find more information um, uh, about this. Here, Luigi Nervi, Norfolk Scope, Norfolk, uh, 1971. Another arena, sports arena. Um, Okay, and now we go to uh, the second presentation today, uh, an architect from Chile, a very interesting architect, Smiljan Radic, who was also born on the 21st of, uh, of June. Smiljan Radic, let's read a little bit about him. He was born, as you see, June 21st, 1965 in Santiago, is an international recognized Chilean architect of Croatian heritage. Radic graduated in 1989 in architecture at the Catholic University of Chile and established his own office in 1995. 
Many of his projects are small scale, such as dwellings and installation designs that bridge across various cultural traditions. Radic was selected to design the 2014 Serpentine Gallery Pavilion in London. Uh, this is the man. So uh, how old is he now? 35 plus 22, uh, 57 years old, uh, and uh, an excellent architect. An excellent architect and uh, uh, inspiring force in the field of contemporary architecture. A poet? Yes, a poet. And he does look like a poet, maybe too much, but, but it's fine. We need architects like him. Drawings, some drawings of Milian Radic. Um, truly, I, 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 I'm not sure Ravenna is a better architect than Radic. Radic, uh, Radic didn't receive the Pritzker. Uh, tomorrow, by the way, we'll talk about Ravenna, but uh, you know, he's, uh, he's there, a very, very important architect. And we are going to see some remarkable buildings by this uh, architect, from, you know, born from, uh, you know, Chilean, uh, from uh, Croatian, Croatian parents. I mean, even his drawings show, uh, you know, uh, considerable, I would say, uh, talent and artist, artistry. Look at the plan of a house he built. You know, uh, the timid functionalist would say, what, what is going on here? It's unclear what's going on. As if unclear, it is not part of life. It is, it is. And he built some remarkable buildings, Milian Radic. Uh, we are going to see most of them. Chile, what is this, an artwork, no? Well, of course it is an artwork and architecture is an art and should be considered an art and should be close and affectionate to art. You know, look, Smilian Radi, Serpentine Gallery, Pavilion, 2014. The structure, we have structure here too, but uh, different from uh, what Pierre Luigi Nervi did. Uh, I'm so glad that on, on, on the very day, on, the, on the same day, I have the chance to talk about Pierluigi Nervi, Milian Radic, and Paolo Soleri, very different architects, and all three of them significant architects and sig significant forces in architecture and culture and art. Okay, extension to charcoal burners house and public space in Culipran, Chile, 1998-1999. A very, very surprising work, very um, uh, kind of ur architecture, primal architecture. Uh, uh, look at this. You know, it's 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 magic. It is magic, and 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 I think architecture needs magic. You know, architecture is not just it's not just, uh, you know, mainstream uh, uh, preoccupations with uh, being, uh, you know, uh, uh, in touch with what's going on in the Netherlands and in Switzerland and more or less copying what they do. Look at this here, done in Chile. Is it architecture? Yes, it is architecture. Is it sustainable? Yes, it is sustainable. Is it mysterious? Yes, it is mysterious. Is it poetical? Yes, it is poetical. You know, we can do this everywhere in the world, in Africa, in Romania, in Chile. You inspire yourself from a primeval architecture and you with courage and artistry and with a sense that architecture is a challenge, you can create very, you know, moving things like uh, Radic did in this case. A house uh, from Chile, uh, 2003, 2005, a different kind of uh, architecture, of course. I think he built all of this, not just this one. Uh, it's prismatic, it's definitely modern. It has a lot of glass, which turns me a little bit off, but uh, forget about what I feel. It's, uh, it's still good architecture, maybe not so original as what we saw before, 
but uh, original are the plants, if we are to call them so, and they should be inspiring. Nature is indeed the force that, uh, as Frank Lloyd Wright said, never lets us down if you study it, if you love it. Uh, Chile is experimenting. Chile is building in very interesting ways. And actually, the most uh, radical of all the experiments that Chile does is in uh, Ciudad Abierta, uh, where you know even the Bauhaus was not as experimental as uh, they are there. You know, it, I, it's always for me a great pleasure to talk about Ciudad Abierta. Anyway, Smilian Radic. They have the chance to have a, you know, a long, uh, long access to the Pacific Ocean, and uh, you know the proximity of that, you know, formidable ocean. All oceans are formidable, but we talk about the Pacific Ocean. Uh, inspires people as it, they inspire. Uh, Teresa Muller, the great uh, landscape um, architect from Chile as well. Copper house. This house constitutes a second tryout with copper as the material of its outer facing. In the small town of Nercon in the south of Chile, the undul undulating texture of the copper seemed to take on a historic quality by emulating the one that was used until the beginning of the 20th century in the house and churches of Chiloe, faced in galvanized steel. In this building, the modulated texture, uh, 30.5 by 95 centimeters, uh, of ribbed electrolytic copper also imitates certain general aspects abounding in the area. The heavy layers of drooping tiles, the deformation in the geometry of the pitch of the roofs, due to successive extensions and bouts of decay, the deep shadows, these roofs, these roof slopes produce and the continuous texture of the outer uh, skin. So, you know, it, it's an architecture that maybe uh, to an extent, uh, uh, that's probably the architect there. Uh, he looks like him actually contemplating. I, I don't know if it's his own house or not, or someone from his family, but it looks like that's uh, Smilian Radic. Um, beautiful landscape. I, and, and the house, yes, it's uh, definitely modern, modernistic. The copper responds to the, the, to the elements. And um, you know that's, that's a good thing. A lot of glass, yes, what can we do? The fascination with glass. Uh, is um, is uh, the trademark of our time. What can we do about it? I guess we could to reduce it a little bit. He left, Radic left. Uh, anyway, I am anxious to arrive at, uh, at the house that he built inspired by the poem of the right angle by Le Corbusier, which is, I think, his masterpiece. A thinker, you can tell he's a thinker, he's meditating. He's maybe even a little bit uh, worried about something. Cosmos maybe. Smilian Radic. I go a little bit quicker because we still have to a lot to see with uh, Paolo Soleri at the end of this. Um, triple uh, presentation. Mestizo Restaurant in Santiago, 2005-2007. This project won a public competition convoked by the municipality of Itacura in Santiago in 2005 for a restaurant. The restaurant is sited at the northeast end of the park, a work by architect Teodoro Fernandez that is still under construction and occupies a corner opposite some extraordinary water gardens stuck between a lookout hill and the pavement skirting the Bicentenario Avenue. Um, yeah, it's a restaurant, but uh, being a restaurant doesn't mean that uh, it cannot be architecture. It can. And uh, 
you know, it, it's uh, unusual in a way. If you look at the vertical supports, you know, he likes big stones and you can see it here too. Um, you know, so there is elegance here and there is the surprise of uh, artistry different from uh, Pierluigi Nervi, but uh, it is. It is not an accident that this architect from Chile was invited to build a serpentine pavilion. No, not at all. I wish they would invite a Romanian architect as well one day. without customers. Casa A, San Clemente, 2008, a drawing. And this is the house. I love this house, actually. It has something almost Japanese about it. You know, it's dramatic in its simplicity, in its triangular simplicity. Uh, one could even call it a Zen house. Uh, look at the big, uh, the big rocks. Uh, it's uh, theatrical, but it's also, uh, I don't know, it's irrational and irrational at the same time. Where do they have these big stones from? You know, they, they are incredible. I mean, uh, House for the poem of the right angle. This is the house I already mentioned. The poem of the right angle, of course, was uh, written and drawn by Le Corbusier. Why exactly he thought because uh, there are no explicit uh, references, you know, connecting the house that he built in 2010, 2012 with this uh, esoteric, actually, alchemical work by Le Corbusier. I don't know. But the house is remarkable, as you can see already from the first uh, from the first picture. It's dramatic, it's cultural, is uh, you know uh, shooting uh, in a way shooting light and receiving light through these massive uh, skylights that are very very sculptural. Uh, the interior is complex, uh, is um, dynamic, uh, very interesting house. And uh, there are all kinds of uh, discoveries to be made here. I still am to learn in, not, in what way it connects with the poem of the right angle by, uh, by Le Corbusier. But you see again and again the connection between theory and practice. This man built a house, but he refers to a famous theoretical work in a way, and an artwork by Le Corbusier. Why did he do so? Because he's an informed architect, because he, he needs to connect, you know, uh, his activity with the activity of uh, his, uh, of the predecessors that meant something to him. Again, I, I regret, I don't know in what way that poem by Le Corbusier if we are to call it a poem, it is a poem. The, this is the plan of this house. Do we see right angles here? Not really. Well, maybe there is one here, but why would he connect it with that um, 
cryptical, esoteric work by Le Corbusier. I don't know. I should read about it somewhere. Is, there must be some clues about it, but it's a very interesting plan, isn't it? Uh, and uh, the section is also good. I like the fact that he invites also unclarity. So it's not just about clarity, but it's also about uh, uh, unclarity. And if you can bring the two together, like you bring stability and instability, clarity and lack of clarity or unclarity, you actually honor the fundamental two forces that uh, contribute to life, perhaps with the equal uh, force and meaning. Uh, look at this sculpture, it's a sculpture. You know, but what, what does the sculpture say? Well, maybe it says uh, something that is not very different from what we see here. You know, this uh, textile work having to do with the uh, weaving, with um, the labyrinth in a way, with uh, this is about the irrationality of life, which should, which should be also honored because life is not just about reason, reason, and again, reason. No, and actually that uh, so-called poem, Le Poem de Long Le Droit by Le Corbusier, which is an alchemical work and it's quite cryptical, uh, is also a celebration in a way of, of everything except the right angle, if we understand by the right, right angle, the paradigm of rationality. I love this here, you know, it's... Uh, it's an image of, uh, of uh, the other forces in life, which, which do exist. A winery in, uh, also in Chile, uh, you know, these wineries have a lot of money. They hire important architects. And uh, I'm a little bit suspicious of these wineries, you know, trying to create temple-like uh, atmospheres when essentially, you know, they are about, uh, you know, a very, you know, uh, upfront uh, kind of intoxication. No, uh, wine, you know, yes, wine could be noble, but uh, in essence, it's about alcohol and it's about getting drunk. Whatever, you know, certain uh, Persian poets uh, might think in um, emphatic terms about wine. Um, well, these uh, expensive structures that wineries that employ, uh, you know, significant architects like Herzog and de Moron, and now we see Smiljan Radic, you know, and look at this, you know, it's, you say this is some kind of a cultural center. Well, it's not a cultural center, it's a winery. And, uh, but they have the money, what can you do about it? They have the money and sometimes they even have the vision to hire the good architects to create. I mean, look at this uh, surreal landscape here with these stones, you know, it's almost a projection of, 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 the, of the heavens on earth, you know, with the stones approximating the stars. So I guess uh, wine is, uh, you know, conducive to you know, uh, surreality or surrealism. Personally, I dislike a little bit this uh, emphatic artistry of something which in essence is, um, as I said, it's, it's about uh, alcohol. It's not about God, really, unless, unless we think that uh, God uh, is revealing uh, himself uh, through, uh, through alcohol, which is maybe sometimes possible because Baudelaire himself said, you know, then if any you know, uh, intoxicate yourselves uh, with uh, wine, virtue or poetry, but he didn't mention just wine. Anyway, a work by another work by uh, Radic, We'll see also the Serpentine Pavilion, I hope here in this presentation, um, these, these drawings are taken from Arch Daily and they have a, a little bit of a tiring way of showing drawings in a very pale way, rigorously drawn, but uh, 
I don't know why they are so pale. The Serpentine Gallery, pavilion, the pavilion of the Serpentine Gallery from 2014 in London. Um, uh, here it is. We know by now that he loves big stones, and uh, here they are. The building is, uh, you know, uh, surprising, isn't it? Again, architecture is an adventure. Architecture is a challenge. You invent something, you are appreciated, hopefully for your invention. You are invited to you know, assert your talent and your vision and your courageous uh, you know, uh, attempt to conceive of an architecture as an adventure and uh, the results are, are for all to see. Unfortunately, this thing like with a serpentine pavilion, I don't think it was destroyed. It was moved to another place after it, it being built. Yeah, a bus stop in Krumbach, Austria. Just a bus stop, a banal bus stop. But Austria had this initiative to invite very important architects to build a small uh, bus structure, bus stop. They invited Radic too. And this is what he did. Uh, for my taste, again, too much glass, but uh, it is a little bit whimsical. I don't know exactly what this is for a bird, maybe a birdhouse. Um, yeah, I, I'm not totally seduced by these large surfaces of glass, but that's what he did. Uh, Fujimoto was also invited, uh, Wang Shu also invited, you know, a very nice initiative. And this can, can, can happen also in our country, you know. If a town or a, even a village has the, the idea to invite important architects to build a bus, little bus stop, you know, uh, that place uh, could make it on the cultural map of Europe and the world. Here he is uh, inside, I guess it was uh, manufactured inside a factory uh, in a studio or something in a workshop and then was brought to where it was supposed to uh, to be a community hub in san pedro de la pa uh, architects milian radic and eduardo castillo and danilo lasca teamed up on this community hub in san pedro de la, la, spa, la paz chile featuring a bright red fire station raised black walkway and the playground. Red it is having to do with fire. It's a fire station and other architects like uh, Studio Gang and others, you know, employed redness for a fire station, of course. It's vast. It's vast, it's abstract. It's almost like a work by, uh, you know, an architectural work derived from some graphic works by uh, Malevich. It has a level of purity and even, uh, you know, some structural uh, uh, adventurousness here a little bit. And then the colors, black and red. Teatro Regional del Biobio, Chile. The architects developed a design with a contrasting interior and exterior appearance based on a code by Polish theater director Tadeusz Kantor, a great uh, theater director. My packagings were an attempt to portend the nature of the object by hiding it, enveloping it. A skin of semi-transparent polytetrafluoroethylene is laid over a regimented concrete framework to create this duality. Uh, from the hour, uh, during the day, it's not so apparent what's going on, but at night, you see better, you see better because this is just a skin that covers, uh, you know, the skin appears to be Apollonian, but behind it is a structure which is more complex and uh, it begins to, to reveal itself uh, better at night. Interesting because the the world of the theater, in fact, is about this. No, this duality. Uh, 
between uh, the appearance towards the outside and uh, you know between facts and uh, the mask uh, look at the structure inside uh, it's uh, like a forest of um, you know uh, structural elements interesting work um, that's it so let's say goodbye to uh, Smiljan Rad uh, Radic and I will go to the third architect today, a very interesting architect and urbanist and visionary uh, artist and uh, so on, uh, Paolo Soleri, also Italian, but he uh, left Italy for the United States and there he accepted himself uh, in very courageous ways. So <clears throat> Paolo Soleri, born on the 21st of June, 1919, and died in 2013, was an Italian architect. He established the educational Cosanti Foundation and Arcosanti. Soleri was a lecturer in the College of Architecture at Arizona State University and a National Design Award recipient in 2006. He coined the concept of arcology, a synthesis of architecture and ecology as the philosophy of democratic society. He died at home of natural causes in April 2013 at the age of 93. Soleri authored several books, including The Bridge Between Matter and Spirit, Is Matter Becoming Spirit, and Arcology, City in the Image of Man. This was the man who attempted nothing less but to build a city with volunteers, a visionary city, and they built a uh, you know, uh, remarkably a lot, uh, not the whole city, of course, but uh, a unique, uh, a unique uh, attempt. Very interesting man, Paolo Soleri, with incredible exhibitions and drawings. I love particularly this picture of him, you know, like an uh, older wise man, but still with a usefulness about the expression of his face. I like Paolo Soleri. Now look at his mad drawings, you know, of his archaeologies. You know, he wanted to uh, uh, promote a different kind of urbanism uh, that he invented, he created. And uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it is all right, visionary. And he began to build a, part, a fragment of it in Arizona. He did. In other words, dreams are possible. If you believe in what you envision and you fight for what you believe in, you might succeed to an extent at least. But the important thing is to be an arrow of longing, as the philosopher said. I love this definition of man, an arrow of longing or a bridge, to be a bridge between yourself and what is outside of yourself. Nothing but a bridge. Arcosanti. Uh, we are going to see what they built. Of uh, he envisioned many, uh, you know, uh, urban structures, ecological or uh, ar I almost said archaeological because there is archaeology present here as well. We are going to see also a building. I hope I have in this presentation uh, a factory he built in Italy before he left for the United States. He was a dreamer, but again and again, a true architect is to be a dreamer as well. Otherwise, we won't talk about him or her, you know, here on this Zoom platform. Not that this matters so much, but uh, you understand what I mean. Uh, anyway, drawings, drawings, these, these are just drawings. We, have, we are going to arrive at the built work uh, and now, of course, these are unusual, you know, and, uh, you know, the, the timid functionalists would protest, would, would find all kinds of, uh, you know, things that don't work. For example, where are the toilets here? Well, he was not concerned with those toilets, okay? Uh, where are the toilets here? Uh, I, I don't know. Where are the parking lots? I don't know. But they represent clearly a very 
you know, complex and developed and perhaps even, uh, uh, you know, uh, rigorous uh, uh, vision about a possible city done in a different way. In this model, we see what they built only here. What is this darker gray? They, they managed to build just this, but it's not so little because the scale is actually very, very big. They build this with volunteers. I don't know how they got their money, you know, to, to, to build such a thing, but they, they began. They began and there was something beautiful, volunteers, students, most of them coming from all over the world to uh, the, the Arizona uh, to help uh, Soleri build his dream. Again, they only arrived at this, but it's not little at all in my opinion. And, 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 and they, and I, I intentionally say they, not him or he, they deserve our applauses and our affection. And look now at images of what they built. Unusual, are they not? Yes, very unusual. But this is what creation is supposed to be in Arizona. Look. And look, discovering the unknown. Uh, you are going to see also his own house, like a cave, a beautiful house that probably Antoni Gaudi would have loved. They were selling uh, things that they made of copper in a workshop there to, to generate a little bit more money. Uh, of course, uh, you know, to fund such a, such a project was not an easy thing. This is actually the ceramic um, uh, factory that he built in Italy. I hope I have other pictures with this. Um, well, anyway, this is an image of, of, of a building he built before he Across the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific Ocean to arrive in the United States. Uh, the man and his dog, I know his older age in his cave in Arizona. You see here Arcosanti, an urban laboratory, an urb urban laboratory. Uh, you know, they had the, they, they, I, I have here images that show a different kind of life where a group of people live together, work together, uh, party together, build together, animated by an idealism, which most people think is not possible, but it is possible. And we see the hands of the craftsperson, maybe he himself, you know, carving something that, you know, later on became a, a piece in the, uh, you know, in, the, in their shop, which they sold to tourists and so on. He is interviewed here. Uh, here he is with his many models. You know, I wonder what he thought. Maybe he thought he was defeated because, you know, uh, always the, the purpose is, uh, is, uh, is larger than, uh, you know, one, one can actually accomplish. But um, this is always the case. The important thing is to be an arrow of longing and to want to uh, want to transgress uh, your own limits and to start to build such a utopian, uh, uh, you know, uh, complex of buildings in Arizona uh, is is almost uh, you know surreal and uh, only in part human, but. But it's possible again and again. It shows, it is shown that where there is passion and there is a vision and you persevere, you can accomplish beautiful things. Look at these young people there, you know. Nobody was paying them to do this work. Why did they go there? Because they wanted to be animated by, by desire. They wanted to contribute to something that they themselves began to believe in. And this man animated them in this sense. They didn't search for credits or points or diplomas. They went there because their heart was telling them to go there. And look at them here in, the, in a circle. I guess uh, Mr. Paolo Soleri is here. Anyway, people around talking, discussing, working together, uh, living together, eating together. It's beautiful. Life can be beautiful when there is idealism. 
a focused idealism and an idealism which doesn't neglect, you know, the, the ABC of life. It embraces it, but still idealism. I think this makes people, when they open their hearts, they make, this makes them, uh, uh, you know, more human in the good sense of the world. Uh, I don't know, is this an 80, 90 years old man? Maybe. Um, they were selling these bell, bells that they were made uh, from a copper. You know, they, they were manufactured. And this is an interesting aspect because his architecture is rather futuristic and modernistic, but the bells are, uh, you know, uh, manufactured kind of in the tradition of the local people there, maybe even Native American Indians. Uh, this is a bridge he designed somewhere in Arizona. Um, but back to, uh, you know, this is the shop where they were selling these things, which are also decorative. But um, I'm glad that they also did such things. And, you know, because it wasn't just ab about an emphatic mega uh, aspiration. It was also about small things where you combine, uh, you know, ornamental um, concerns with uh, practicality even. Um, I like these things because these things connect with a certain tradition, uh, connect with uh, arts and crafts, connects, connects with the work of the hand, the human hand, uh, a fragment of a building built at Arcosanti, uh, other structures uh, built there, uh, you know, Heidegger was right when he talked about building, dwelling, and thinking, not necessarily in this order. If you live and work and build and think in the same place and learn and study in the same place with other people, uh, interesting things could come into being. He was an intense man, an interesting man. I like Paolo Soleri. And, uh, you know, he, he wanted to change the world in essence, right? He wanted to change the world. Did he succeed? Probably not. Putin is still uh, waging uh, horrible, uh, uh, tragic wars, uh, uh, but uh, the attempt has to be there. And he had it, he attempted, he did, he did honor life with the best he was able to give. And, uh, you know, some people say, could say that no one could live here except some dreamers, but we need the dreamers. Uh, exhibitions uh, by Paolo Soleri, how many architects can even do one exhibition like this? He did many. Uh, he also built, as you can see, in Arizona. Here he is, uh, but the furniture is probably found furniture on the streets or who knows where. They were certainly not uh, design pieces. It's okay, it's fine. The generosity of the vision didn't have uh, time, so to speak, for uh, you know designing high-end uh, uh, chairs or whatever. It's okay. I think this belonged to a car. No, not. I guess so. It looks like it. Well, <laughs> it's inside the, one of the rooms or spaces at Arcosanti. Uh, this is a project that he did later. I have to create, I think, another presentation about him. Arts and crafts, the bell, uh, the bell, uh, which shows also a certain nostalgia uh, for, uh, yeah, for uh, a different uh, way of, 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 uh, of uh, you know, making things where the human hand was um, present, uh, very much so. But on the other hand, look at the, at the, at the vision of his uh, um, archaeology, you know, of which again, they only build this. But who knows, who knows, maybe in the future, maybe an Elon Musk, if he is not too concerned with himself and not too concerned with leaving the earth, might invest, in fact, he could now, to uh, have this uh, experiment uh, grow, if to, even after uh, Paolo Soleri died. Uh, ceramic works also themselves, I would say beautiful, you know, uh, expressing artistry, invention, 
creativity and uh, earth, because that's what uh, uh, ceramic tiles are. It's even written here, the ceramic studio. They had a ceramic studio there, and this is his own house. Wow, wow, you know, you don't have to go to the moon or to Mars to have this kind of house. You can do it on earth. Uh, and uh, he did it, uh, you know, I'm absolutely sure that Antoni Gaudi and not just him, uh, Bruce Goff as well and others, uh, Bart Prince and others would, would have loved it, including Doshi from India, because art has no frontiers. And uh, yes, there are drawings, there are books, there are textiles. There is sensitivity in other words, and here is the man with a huge uh, drafting board. And uh, I guess that could be a, a big ashtray. He probably smoked a lot, but very interesting uh, cave he had, didn't he? Paolo Soleri carved earth form for the original drafting room and interior of the ceramic, ceramics workshop. Uh, this is the again uh, an image of the factory he built in I forgot where maybe Turin, Torino in Italy, uh, but again a ceramics uh, factory before he left for uh, for the United States. Drawings, 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 dreams. He didn't think that he was uh, doing uh, you know. Uh, uh, futile work. No, no, what you de do of passion, of love, in other words, is never futile. No one would say it's futile to be in love. I, I kept, uh, I kept uh, recalling what um, Fernando Pessoa, the great Portuguese poet said. He said, you know, those who write, uh, you know, love letters, those who write love letters, they are not the ridiculous ones. The ridiculous ones are those who do not, who do not write them. I, uh, the prosaic uh, functionalist would say that the one who spends his time or her time writing love letters is ridiculous because life, love does not exist. Well, in opposition, Fernando Pessoa, who knew better because poets are always right in the end, the good poets, said, no, the ridiculous ones are those who do not write the love letters. And I agree with him. Yes, those are ridiculous, who do not open their hearts, who do not express their love for life, for another person, for work, for architecture, for whatever. They are ridiculous. And there are so many of those, unfortunately. The cynics, those who think that to write a love letter is ridiculous and uh, useless and futile and all the rest. A city of the future. Who thinks of the city of the future? Well, Paolo Soleri did. Paolo Soleri builds a living model of his community of tomorrow in the Arizona desert. How did he get this, that piece of land? I have no idea. How did he get all those people helping him? I have no idea. But he did because passion can move mountains. Uh, as Frank Lloyd Wright said, and I totally agree with him, talent is good, practice is better, passion is best. If we have passion, talent comes, even practice comes. But if you don't have passion, you could have talent, you could practice, nothing good comes out of it because there is no love. And without love, Anyway, I'm saying banal things, I know. But look at the rainbow there, you know, illuminating a darkened sky above our Cosanti and drawings and drawings and thinking and dreaming, wanting to change the world. Did he succeed? No. But the attempt is important. Even if we don't succeed, it's important to, to, to move forward, to, to Envision a horizon of hope. Paolo Soleri, Arcosanti. Yeah, he's a modest man, actually, animated by uh, immodest dreams. It's true.
architectures and adventure. This is an image of the factory of the ceramics factory he built in Italy. Impressive too, isn't it? I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I wish I had a better presentation of this early work by him in Italy, but I like what I see. It's almost the, the Cathedral of Ceramics. No, the Cathedral of Erotic Misery, uh, the one I talked about uh, yesterday, uh, presenting the works of uh, Kurt Schwitters, but uh, it's uh, the Cathedral of Ceramics. Very nice work by Paolo Soleri. And as you can see, he envisioned all kinds of things. He built much less than what he envisioned, but still, look at this. It's, uh, it's, it's in a way it's majestic, you know, it's impressive, it's, it's, it's dramatic. Maybe he was also, you know, bringing to the new world, um, you know, remnants of memory of Imperial Rome or uh, who knows what. Um, it's not uh, without importance that he was born and raised in Italy. What do we see here? Theater, art. Who are the players, the dancers, the, well, the students who came to help him, perhaps most of them architecture students, design students. And, 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 and they didn't just work, they also played. And look at them eating together underneath the, the big, uh, uh, you know, structure that, uh, that themselves built. I love this, you know, communal life, people coming together, finding, making friends, cooking together, eating together, uh, working together, studying together, discussing. This is, this is life. This is lived life. And, uh, you know, uh, this made, made it possible through his vision. Uh, there is an idealized architecture here. One could even refer to idealized Renaissance uh, um, the visions of the, uh, of the uh, you know, utopian, the ideal uh, uh, Renaissance city. That's it. That's it for the moment. So let's wish happy birthday to Paolo Soleri and uh, thank you for being here today. Happy birthday to him, to Radic, and to the first architect we talk about today. That is Pierre Luigi Nervi. <laughs>